That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong said those historic words as he became the first man to put his foot on the moon. It was a very cautious step. At least one scientist had predicted that Neil would sink out of sight in a sea of powdery dust. Hello, I'm Jim Lovell, your host for America's Achievements in Space, created by the Easton Press from documentary films produced by NASA. The landing on the moon was both a beginning and an end. The beginning of a new era of space exploration and the end result of six Mercury flights, 10 Gemini missions, and four previous Apollo journeys. The great space adventure began with Alan Shepard's Mercury flight in 1961. This volume details the events leading to that first flight. You can see and feel the concern of everyone involved. Rockets had previously exploded on the launch pad, so equipment was checked and rechecked. Three weeks before Al was to lift off, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. The pressure to catch up was great. The flight lasted only 16 minutes, but it put the U.S. in the space race. You'll appreciate the contrast between Al's flight and the complex Gemini 12 mission only five years later. I was command pilot on that one and Buzz Aldrin flew with me. He took three walks in space and we also performed a difficult maneuver without using any fuel to hold our positions. The Soviets hadn't done that. Buzz Aldrin went on to make the first moon landing with Neil Armstrong. The pictures they took will leave you breathless. From the spacecraft you will see the moon surface as the moon surface comes closer and closer. You'll see Neil take that first tentative step, then bounce and hop around. One of my favorite sequences shows the landing ship rocketing from the moon's surface. That maneuver had to be executed perfectly or Neil and Buzz would never have returned to Earth. So here's some dramatic footage of man achieving two of his oldest dreams, flying in space and visiting the moon. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 13 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Uh, there's a great deal of contrast in it, and uh, currently it's upside down on our monitor, but we can make out uh, a fair amount of detail. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Sunday, July 20th, 1969. Around the world, nearly a billion people watched this moment on television as the first man from Earth prepared to set foot upon the moon. At the foot of the ladder, the lamb footbeds are only... Uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. All that we have accomplished in space, all that we may accomplish in days and years to come, we stand ready to share for the benefit of all mankind. As we explore the reaches of space, let us go to the new worlds together. Not as new worlds to be conquered, but as a new adventure to be shared. Since the earliest time man has imagined this moment, the moment when his fellow man would make the first journey to the moon. Now the time had come. In the sixth decade of the 20th century, 
the ancient dream was to become a reality. The flight of Apollo 11 was the culmination of many years of planning, working, building, and testing. Thousands of people had contributed toward this day of accomplishment. The great Saturn V rocket and the complex Apollo spacecraft had been assembled together and moved to the launch pad. The equipment and techniques and personnel had been proved in earlier missions, and now they were ready. The astronauts chosen for this mission had flown it many times in ground-based simulators. They had all been in space before. They had trained carefully and well. And now, they too were ready. Astronaut Michael Collins would pilot the Apollo command module. Astronaut Edwin Aldrin, Jr. would pilot the lunar module. and astronaut Neil Armstrong would serve as mission commander. Armstrong would be the first man to step upon the moon. July 16th, the day had come. The moon awaited. The men rose early, ate breakfast, and dressed in their spacesuits. Other astronauts had made this journey to the launch pad, but never with such anticipation. 9.32 a.m., July 16th. later, the Apollo command module moves forward to extract the lunar module from the third stage of the launch vehicle. Both are moving at more than 17,000 miles an hour. Docked together, they will sail a quarter million miles across the sea of space and into orbit around the Earth's nearest neighbor. Oh, loud and clear now, Mike, and we understand that you are docked. During the three-day journey to the moon, the astronauts kept busy. Checklists, navigation and observation, housekeeping. They must work in a weightless environment, keeping their spacecraft and themselves in good condition. Data must be collected and reported. Experiments must be performed, including photography both inside and outside the spacecraft. Because of the film speed, these actions appear faster than they actually were. July 19th. Apollo 11 slows down and goes into orbit around the moon. The bright blue planet of Earth now lies 238,000 miles beyond the lunar horizon. Astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin, now in the lunar module, separate from the command module.
astronaut Collins remains behind. Preparation for the lunar module descent to the moon now begins. Command module assumes the new name, Columbia. The lunar module will be called the Eagle. From Columbia, Michael Collins' camera sees bright rays of the sun reflecting patterns of color from the surface of the Eagle. In this strange metallic bird, rides the ancient and endless dream of all mankind. The command pilot can see detail which his camera cannot record. The four landing pads of the lunar module are fully extended and locked in place. The eagle is poised and prepared for its descent to the lunar surface. craft rocket engine fires to slow it down and to place it on the pathway to the landing site in the sea of tranquility. There is tension and caution as the eagle flies lower. Warning lights blink on as the computer tries to keep up with the demand for control data, but the status remains go. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good. Over. Roger, copy. Eagle Houston out the yaw around, angles, uh, S-band pitch, minus niner, yaw, plus one eight. Roger, you're a go to, con you go to continue power descent, you're a go to continue power descent. Altitude now 21,000 feet, still looking very good. Velocity down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great to us, Eagle. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you, we're going at alarm. Good radar data. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Top alarm. Altitude 1600. 1400 feet. Still looking very good. 700 feet. 21 down. 33 degrees. 100 feet down at 19. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. We're go, same type, we're go. Altitude, velocity, light, three and a half down, 220 feet. 15 forward. 11 forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet. Four and a half down, five and a half down. 60 seconds. Lights on. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. That's 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Four forward. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. That's okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Through the window of the Eagle, Armstrong and Aldrin see what no human eyes have ever seen before. Their spacecraft casts a long shadow across the undisturbed dust of centuries. Seven hours after landing, after careful preparations for later ascent were completed, Armstrong opens the eagle hatch and begins his climb down to the surface.
first footsteps on this strange new world must be taken cautiously. The moon has only one-sixth the gravity of Earth. The nature of its surface was still unknown. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Once on the surface, Armstrong scoops up a small sample of lunar dust and rock. Precaution against the possibility of an emergency takeoff. According to plan, astronaut Aldrin now descends from the Eagle. He and his equipment would weigh 383 pounds on Earth. Here, they weigh about 66 pounds. First men on the moon stand and look at the stark, lonely landscape around them, an experience which no one before them can share. But there is much to be done in the limited time which they can stay on this airless, cloudless satellite of Earth. This sheet of metal foil traps and holds particles from the sun, the so-called solar wind, or barrage of solar energy, which constantly strikes the moon's surface. Results of this experiment will be taken back to Earth to reveal new secrets to anxious scientists. An American flag is left behind on the moon, together with medals honoring American and Soviet spacemen who lost their lives in earlier space tests, and a small disk carrying messages of goodwill from 73 nations on Earth. A plaque on the lunar module reads, Here, men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. We came in peace for all mankind. Through a specially made television camera, viewers in many nations on Earth were able to watch the astronauts as they walked and worked on the moon. Despite the bulky spacesuits and the backpacks containing oxygen, temperature control, and communications equipment, the Apollo 11 crew found they could move easily about the surface. Because there is no wind or rain on the moon, these footprints will remain for centuries. In addition to collecting rock and soil samples, the explorers leave behind a seismometer. This highly sensitive device would send back valuable information on external meteoroid impacts, as well as internal lunar movements. prism laser reflector would help man to measure the exact distance from Earth to Moon to an accuracy of six inches. These were the first of many experiments which will be taken to the Moon to provide man continuing and increasing knowledge about the Moon and the vastness of space beyond. 
After two hours and 31 minutes, the first lunar explorers had completed their research on the moon. A night of rest in the lunar module, countdown preparations, and they were ready to come home. Tranquility Base, uh, Houston. Guidance recommendation uh, is pings, and you're cleared for takeoff. Roger, understand. We're number one on the runway. Seven, six, five, port stage, engine arm ascent. First, the Eagle and its two-man crew lifted off the moon perfectly and climbed slowly to rendezvous and dock with the mother ship, Columbia. Armstrong and Aldrin explored the moon, astronaut Collins had kept a long and lonely vigil in the Columbia. The approaching eagle was a welcome sight. Later, the three men would share their reflections on this adventure with the world. I believe that uh, from the early space flights, we demonstrated a potential to carry out this type of a mission. And again, it was a question of time until this would be accomplished. I think it's a technical triumph for this country to have uh, said what it was going to do a number of years ago, and then by golly do it. The relative ease with which we were able to carry out our mission, which of course came after a very efficient and a logical sequence of flights, I think that this demonstrated that uh, we were certainly on the right track when we took this commitment to, to go to the moon. I just see it uh, as a beginning, a beginning of a new age. Once again, the bright blue planet of Earth rises over the lunar horizon. For those who had witnessed man's landing in the Sea of Tranquility, the moon would never again 
appear quite the same. July 24th, dawn in the Pacific. Apollo blazes across the heavens, coming back to Earth at 25,000 miles an hour. President Richard Nixon, who had talked with the astronauts by telephone while they were on the moon, was waiting aboard the recovery carrier to welcome the returning voyagers. The president later expressed the nation's response to this historic mission. Some way, when those two Americans stepped on the moon, the people of this world were brought closer together. That it is that spirit, the spirit of Apollo, that America can now help to bring to our relations with other nations. The spirit of Apollo transcends geographical barriers and political differences it can bring the people of the world together in peace. To protect against any possible lunar contamination, the astronauts put on airtight special garments before coming aboard the rescue ship. They transferred directly from the helicopter to a mobile quarantine van in which they would be flown back to the manned spacecraft center in Houston, Texas. July 27th, the journey was ended. They were home again. three weeks of isolation, medical tests, and mission debriefings. Then visits to major cities of America and abroad. The details of their unique mission would be relived and remembered so that others might learn what they had learned and that future travelers in space might build upon their experience. Rock and soil samples brought back would be examined and analyzed by scientists in many lands. They would reveal new insights into the origin and the age and the composition of the moon, and perhaps new knowledge of the earth as well. Already experiments left on the moon were sending back revealing new information. The mission was successfully completed. The Eagle had landed the first men on the moon and Columbia had returned them safely to Earth. Wherever man journeys tomorrow across the ocean of our universe, history will remind him that Apollo 11 was mankind's first encounter with a new world.
have always presented a challenge to man. Many secrets remain locked in space, secrets that have puzzled men for centuries. The search for knowledge about space is underway. Hundreds of scientific rockets and satellites have been launched. As the information is collected from space, it is made available to people all over the world. Already, startling and practical advances in many scientific fields have resulted. information was obtained from scientific instruments in the rockets and satellites. Now, man himself is to follow these mechanical devices. Cape Canaveral, Florida, May 5, 1961. U.S. Mercury astronaut Alan B. Shepard enters his spacecraft. Very shortly, he will be on his way into space. As the hatch goes on, two big questions come to your mind. Is the vehicle ready? Are you ready? Before the flight, Shepard had this to say. I think the one thing that strikes me as I look back on the training program is that I have really developed a feeling of confidence. A confidence in the people with whom I work, a confidence in the systems with which I am dealing and will have to deal in flight, and of course, a confidence in myself. You're confident, but you're human, and you go over the program just one more time. A feeling of confidence. It began to grow from the day you and your six fellow astronauts were selected from hundreds of volunteers. Confidence in the people of Project Mercury, the spacecraft, and the launch vehicle. And confidence in yourself. You were involved in the design of the Mercury system almost from the beginning, contributed ideas and modifications. You worked with the engineers, came to know the components and systems like you know your own car. And you followed the tests, test after test after test, to make sure the design did what it was supposed to do. Research and development was underway, you went through almost two years of training. You flew mission after mission in a trainer just like the craft you're sitting in today, became completely familiar with every control and instrument. academic program informed you and the other pilots on astronautics, space mechanics, and spaceflight, kept you briefed on all new developments in the project. Zero gravity flights and aircraft acquainted you with the condition of weightlessness you would encounter in flight. You got in a lot of centrifuge time, too. Today's flight won't submit you to any G-forces you haven't experienced before. The program simulated every possible situation. You know you're ready to react almost automatically.
controlling the craft attitude by manual control of pitch, roll, and yaw jets. That will be part of your mission today, and you're confident that you can do it. You piled up plenty of experience in the three-dimensional rotation. You know that even if tumbling situations occur after separation, you can bring the craft under control with your manual control system. There were continuing flights in high-performance aircraft. They were important to you, too. You're an experienced test pilot. Flying is your business in any type of craft. You remember extensive training in escape and survival techniques. There is always the slight chance the spacecraft may land outside the pre-planned area. As you sit in the spacecraft, waiting for launch, you know your training has covered every conceivable eventuality, every emergency, no matter how unlikely. Project Mercury got underway, production of Redstone launch vehicles began at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Careful, individual production of vehicles earmarked for Mercury from the day the first bolt came into the plant. The Redstone was available, and with modifications it would do the job. Donald Aircraft Company plant at St. Louis, just three months after project inception, prototype spacecraft production was begun. A few short months later, production spacecraft were being completed. Your trips to the production points were important. You became thoroughly familiar with the Mercury systems. The closer you got to the system, the more confident you became. You followed the flight test program closely. Components, then systems, then prototypes, then production craft. A pyramid of testing. A pyramid of tests that would lead to manned flight. You knew that data and know-how was being gathered to reduce the risk element. forces were exercised. Procedures were developed to locate the craft and retrieve it. It became obvious that the craft would not be in the water very long after landing. A chimpanzee named Ham and two monkeys successfully flown in the spacecraft indicated the feasibility of manned flight. this was behind, and you knew everything humanly possible had been done to minimize risk to you and to the other astronauts. It was time now for manned ballistic flight. Mercury Redstone 3. At Cape Canaveral, launch pad 5. Preparations for the MR3 flight began weeks before launch day. You went out and watched the Redstone slowly, carefully raised into place on the launch pad you knew that you might be the pilot. For about 10 days prior to meeting with the spacecraft, the Redstone underwent exhaustive tests, inspections, and simulated launch operations. This vital part of the mission, the launch vehicle, must be as near perfect as man can make it before the spacecraft is installed. You and your fellow astronauts followed the test program closely.
ground was being checked, the spacecraft underwent test procedures at Hangar S, several miles from the launch pad. Test the electrical systems, the mechanical systems, communications, instrumentation, the sequential system. Verify flight readiness. You participated in many of the tests and checkouts yourself. You had worked closely with the vehicle for many months. If possible, you got even closer to it during the days just before launch. You worked with the Mercury engineers and technicians as they prepared the craft. The feeling of confidence in the mission became even stronger. Your fellow astronauts worked with the same team effort that had prevailed over the two years of getting ready. You couldn't be everywhere at once, but they could cover for you. And as you sit in the spacecraft, you know everything is as ready as it can possibly be. They covered the control center, the blockhouse, the launch vehicle, the tracking stations. They kept a finger on the pulse of the operation. The spacecraft was checked out in a pressure chamber capable of 120,000 foot altitudes to test the environmental control system. And then you were added to the system. You made sure that your pressure suit and the life support system were working properly. You knew that you weren't just going for the ride. You would be required to gather information, make practical contributions, make sure you collected usable data. You remember the final days in Hangar S, the retro rocket package being installed, and you know the care, the attention to every detail that went into the final servicing. The escape tower with its solid propellant rocket. The system which will pull the spacecraft safely clear of the launch vehicle before a catastrophic failure, either on the pad before launch, during the launch, or while the vehicle is in powered flight. It's a reassuring thought as you go through your pre-launch countdown. When each spacecraft system has been thoroughly checked out, a complete simulated launch and flight operation was run to make certain all the systems work together as well as individually. And then the Mercury spacecraft was moved to the launch pad to be mated with its launch vehicle. At the pad, the spacecraft was raised to position on top of the vehicle. Now you knew that the final round of testing was at hand. This flight will provide added qualification for the spacecraft and its systems in space and train a pilot for later Atlas boosted orbital flights. After mating, the testing began to make certain the launch vehicle, spacecraft and blockhouse work together properly. The launch countdown was checked step by step and the complete MR3 system was verified to confirm flight readiness. Complete flight missions from liftoff through landing, both for normal and for emergency cases were flown electronically. The spacecraft was heavily instrumented to provide pertinent data during the flight. Throughout this period, all the elements of the mission made their preparations. Recovery forces, tracking stations, the Mercury Control Center rehearsed the mission again and again. You and your fellow astronauts rehearsed your parts, went through the procedures over and over. Three days before launch, a go, no go review board evaluated the flight readiness of all the mission elements, spacecraft, launch vehicle, pilots, tracking stations, recovery forces, everything. The decision? Go. The recovery forces were dispatched and on their way to their stations downrange. May 1st, 1961. Less than two and a half years from Project Mercury initiation. Countdown for a manned flight was in progress. And that's a day that you'll never forget. MR3 followed a split countdown, about four hours the first day, a little over six hours the second day. This procedure helps reduce personnel fatigue. Hydrogen peroxide fueling. This is used in the spacecraft attitude control system. The first day's countdown was completed with this operation. 
very early in the morning, May 2nd, the final countdown is underway. Liquid oxygen for the launch vehicle. Before this operation, a meeting had been held to review the weather situation. The weather was marginal, but the decision? Go. At the Mercury Control Center, every detail of the countdown and status of all other elements, such as the recovery forces and the tracking stations, was carefully monitored. The Mercury Operations Director manages the entire flight from the center. In the blockhouse, systems checks were completed in the spacecraft. Launch vehicle checks were also completed. The recovery forces were on station in a line along the flight path, ready to retrieve the craft even if there should be an undershoot or an overshoot. You remember the final physical at Hangar S, the feeling that now, at last, the time was almost at hand. And you remember the feeling of confidence that you had, confidence that all systems were ready and that you were ready too. Before leaving the hangar for the launch pad, you had sensor leads attached to your body. These leads would provide telemeter data on your body functions and reactions during the flight. Mercury flights are designed to provide comprehensive information about man during space flight. Information that can be used by people all over the world in their own research projects. And then it happened. You remember the letdown feeling you got when the squawk box gave the word. Test number 108, MR3, was scrubbed because of weather. A letdown feeling, yes, but it was reassuring to know that the mission would not go unless everything was right. Then it was Friday, May 5th, three days later, and the countdown was proceeding again. You remember the feeling you had that this was the day. There'd be no scrub today. The mission would go. You remember the ride to the pad in the transport van. You had rehearsed the procedure before, taken the ride to the pad and climbed into the spacecraft. But this time, you knew it was the real thing. located at the pad, 
it can operate in any terrain. At the viewing stands about two miles away, hundreds of press, radio, and television representatives stand by to witness the launch. A helicopter stands by to take a doctor anywhere he might be needed. Astronauts Carpenter and Shira take off to make direct aerial observation of the early portion of your flight. An amphibious vehicle is standing by, ready to move out if necessary to make a close-in recovery. The Recovery Force helicopters are airborne. All elements of the mission have reported ready to the control center, and the launch is go. Ready to resume the uh, count, uh, STE. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Stoney, uh, verify. Right. Resume the count. Okay, Stoney, take it over. Roger. Uh, Five seconds. Okay, seven, Stoney, how do you uh, Seven, loud and clear, Stoney. All right, we're loud and clear, also. One minute and counting. Roger. Roger, periscope has retracted. That's the front periscope to cut. Rain bus 24 volts, 26 amps. Oxygen is still okay. 
followed a normal ballistic arc, peaking at about 115 mile altitude. The spacecraft landed 300 miles downrange. The complete flight took 16 minutes and gave Alan Shepard about five minutes of weightlessness. After the spacecraft landed, Shepard and the craft were on the Lake Champlain. Complete and detailed information on the flight and on Alan Shepard was recorded from launch to recovery. Information to be made available to scientists and interested people the world over. Within minutes after the flight, Shepard received a well done from the president on behalf of the people of the United States. A well done accepted by Shepard as a representative of all the people in Project Mercury. Project Mercury, another step in man's search for knowledge. Freedom 7, another step toward man in space. Perhaps most of us have forgotten the precise day. It was June 3rd, 1965. But not many of us will forget the experience of seeing Ed White leave the open hatch of Gemini 4. He said simply, all right, I'm out. EVA, which began so successfully with this 20 minute walk in space, was not so easy in later flights. We scheduled five more EVAs, lengthened the time, and added space work to the flight plan but we gave the astronaut too high a workload to perform, and the problem was compounded by the pilot's difficulty in positioning himself during work periods. Now we were coming up on the last flight and the last EVA, with questions about EVA still unresolved. And Gemini 12 would launch in 60 days. Part of the answer may be found under the water of this pool where we have submerged mock-ups of the spacecraft and a Gina target docking adapter. We had done research in underwater simulation of space conditions for some months. Now for the first time a flight crew will incorporate underwater simulation into their EVA work training. In an inflated pressure suit, astronaut Edwin Aldrin, pilot for Gemini 12, is weighted with 60 pounds of lead. He is positioned at the prepared Agena workstation by trained scuba divers. Underwater simulation creates a condition of neutral buoyancy, 
it gives the pilot an effect quite similar to that of zero gravity. Astronaut Aldrin has attached himself by a waist tether to rings on the Agena. From past EVA experiences, we learned that astronauts spent far too much energy trying to stay in position while working. Waist tethers are one of the restraints that we are investigating for Gemini 12. The jobs now performed underwater by pilot Aldrin are those which will be done on Gemini 12. Attaching handholds, using a torque wrench to tighten bolts, making electrical connections, clean up of his work area. In short, the type of jobs we know are basic to space station work. As he will during flight, pilot Aldrin has moved by handrails from the Agena workstation to the adapter area. He is now ending a rest period. We have carefully planned the rest periods of this EVA in relation to the workload. Leaning backward, pilot Aldrin tests another type of restraint used in the adapter area, special foot restraints. These are also called Dutch shoes by some people for obvious reasons. The chief advantage of underwater simulation is that it gives a training EVA pilot continuity of tasks. As such, it is a valuable addition to zero-G simulations in aircraft where the zero-G condition is attained in the parabola of flight for only 30 seconds. Pilot Aldrin and his backup crewman, Pilot Cernan, are able to simulate the entire EVA exercise of Gemini 12 without a break, step by step from the beginning, as it is written in the flight plan. They run two-hour simulations underwater several times and finish training almost on the eve of launch. On November 11, 1966, the Atlas Agena target vehicle for Gemini Rendezvous and docking lifted off the pad at Cape Kennedy, seven minutes after 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Gemini 12 was now slightly more than an hour and a half from launch. Command pilot for the mission was Jim Lovell, already a veteran of the longest manned space flight, 14 days on Gemini 7. In the four days ahead, he would log more hours in space than any other man. His pilot was astronaut Aldrin. The Agena was inserted into an orbit of 164 nautical miles by 159 nautical miles. Mission director Bill Schneider gave the final go for the launch of the last Gemini. Liftoff came at 3.46 Eastern Standard Time. The launch vehicle propelled the spacecraft as smoothly as it had in 11 previous flights. And Gemini 12 was headed for an orbit of 146 by 87 nautical miles. The first order of business after insertion into orbit would be an M equals three rendezvous, or rendezvous during the third revolution. Maneuvers proceeded according to plan. A radar lock-on with the Agena was reported at 235 nautical miles. And the crew sighted the target using a sextant telescope at 85 nautical miles. But as the distance decreased to 64 miles, the crew reported erratic radar response. The crew immediately went to a backup rendezvous mode, onboard computations. The pilot bent over his charts, relaying distance and burn rates to the command pilot. And at uh, 2 plus zero 5 plus 4 8. I should have put it in there. This method had been used successfully as early as the Gemini 9 flight and presented no problem. 
12, Houston, one minute to LOS. You can go encoder on. Roger. Have fun. But still it is interesting to note that the pilot making the computations this time had written his doctoral thesis on just this subject, rendezvous modes. Dr. Aldrin was as calm as though he were sitting in the graduate stack studying. And Command Pilot Lovell brought Gemini 12 to a station keeping position at Tananarive, three hours, 46 minutes after liftoff. He began making his preliminary docking approach. He will dock south of Japan within range of the tracking ship Coastal Sentry Quebec, or CSQ in the flight controller's call letters. Is he docked, CSQ? All right, I got a flight. Okay, you satisfied with the Agena? Both vehicles are go. Okay, let him know that. As docking practice continued in the third revolution, Pete Conrad, the Capcom on duty, broached a problem to the crew. It concerned the Agena primary propulsion system, the PPS. The problem appears to be uh, one that indicates a possible uh, turbine uh, pump problem. And uh, we're going to give you a go a little bit later on as to whether you can make the PPS burn or not. There had been a momentary drop in the pressure in the thrust chamber of the PPS during insertion. It then returned to normal. But that one second drop in pressure was enough to bring the Gemini specialists onto the floor of mission control. The pressure drop could cancel plans for the PPS burn today, which would inject the docked vehicles into a higher orbit of 400 nautical miles. The decision came in the fourth revolution and was relayed through the Hawaii tracking station. The big burn, such as we saw on Gemini 10 and Gemini 11, was out for this mission. But the crew was given no chance to settle back for a couple hours free ride, or crack open a good novel, even if they had one aboard. Mission Control came up with a substitute plan. It was this. Tomorrow, Gemini 12 would take photos of the solar eclipse over South America. For eclipse phasing, Command Pilot Level would make two Agena burns, but with a smaller secondary propulsion system. And one more change. The crew would go to sleep an hour early, but they would wake up two hours early. Hawaii bid them good night on the fifth pass and summed up things to this point pretty well. It's been kind of a busy day, uh, thanks much. Uh, that about does it, and uh, flight says to tell you good night. Two major events faced the crew on the second day after they were awakened by the Canary Station. Gemini 12, Canary Capcom. Canaries, this is 12, well, loud and clear, I'll be. Ah, oh, you're loud and clear, good morning. How did you have a good sleep? Oh, so, so, not bad. Two solid hours sleep, they said. This has been the pattern of past flights. You doze off and on during the first night and settle down to regular sleep the next night but they were ready. First for eclipse photography, then a stand-up EVA. Gemini 12 was in good position for the eclipse. The command pilot shot time exposures for later scientific study. The stand-up EVA began over the Canaries. The hatch was open at 19 hours, 29 minutes into the mission. Pilot Aldrin reported that he had only a minor tendency to float upward and had no difficulty in maintaining the position he wished in the open hatch. Okay, I'm just drifting here. It looks like I have a small tendency to float out, but very little. What a beautiful view. There was also preparation for the umbilical EVA of the following day. A portable handrail was installed from spacecraft hatch to the cone of the target docking adapter. It was left in position to be used Sunday. A major portion of this EVA was devoted to star photography, shooting so-called hot stars, 
much of whose light is in the ultraviolet spectrum. 80% of this is filtered out by the Earth's atmosphere. From Gemini, astronomers can study data unobtainable from the Earth. After two hours, 28 minutes, the hatch was closed and the crew was repressurizing their cabin over Canton Island. Jim Lovell reported, it was a pretty good exercise and I'm starving to death. The flight director was obliging. Neat period for you starting at 2300 to 2350. Sunday morning began rather abruptly, shortly after 3 a.m. by the clocks at Manned Spacecraft Center. Flight Director Krantz woke the crew about an hour and a half early to check out fuel cell operation. He took one bulky stack off the line. The crew was then invited to nap a little longer. Waking up early for one reason or another would be a feature of this flight. But the crew seemed to like keeping a farmer's hours. They declined sleep and went to work taking another bite out of the 14 experiments of the mission. On the 27th revolution over Carnarvon, a go was given for the umbilical EVA and space work. EVA began over the South Pacific beyond contact with the ground. Mission control could only wait it out until the spacecraft passed over the states and into tracking range. How was it going? We had restudied work in space for this flight. We replanned our tasks, and it was a last chance for Gemini. But waiting is sometimes a hard job. How was it going? Onboard cameras show us that it was going pretty well indeed. Pilot Aldrin moves out the hatch along the portable handrail, which he had installed during the stand-up EVA the day before. He attaches a tether from the Agena to the spacecraft. That tether would come in for some good use later today. The spacecraft was now passing over the United States and Mission Control received its first news of what was going on. Buzz Aldrin was at the Agena workstation. While working, he is attached by a waist tether. This gives him a secure position, and he has both hands free for the job. Doctors were counting his heartbeat closely during the work period. So far, it had been pretty much below 120. After finishing up at the Agena workstation, Aldrin makes his way along the handrails to the hatch and a rest period. At this time, he is at the adapter area and has been conducting the EVA for more than 40 minutes. Although we have no onboard film of the adapter work area, the pilot performed seven tasks there, much as we saw in the underwater simulation. When we next pick up the EVA on film, the astronaut is again at the Agena workstation. He tests the waist tether and comments, the restraints are good. I don't see any problem in positioning my body at all. The next assignment is use of a torque wrench on a bolt. The same type of job had been performed at the adapter section. The wrench can be set for any value from 50 to 200 inch pounds. He had performed 19 tasks. 12 at the Agena station, 7 at the adapter. A good EVA work session. Now, like any good workman, the pilot sets about cleaning up his work area. Okay, he said, workstation is clear. As he got back in, Jim Lovell greeted him with, Okay, here's your seat, Buzz. That's it. Gemini 12, Houston Capcom, one minute to LOS. New EVA record, beautiful job. That new record was two hours, nine minutes on umbilical EVA. Command pilot level undocked from his target vehicle, 47 hours, 31 minutes from liftoff. He was between stations, between Carnarvon and Canton Island. Command pilot level is backing off slowly from the target vehicle, pulling on the 100-foot Dacron tether attached to his spacecraft during the umbilical EVA. He will now attempt to extend this tether until it loses all slackness and becomes taut. As expected, that takes a bit of doing at first. The tether whips back and forth and develops loops. 
But if the command pilot can position these two vehicles on the tether, the one lower, as the Agena is, and the other higher, as is Gemini 12, there will be a very slight difference in the gravitational pull of the Earth upon the two. Small as it is, this difference may be strong enough to stabilize the spacecraft and the Agena. Now Gemini 12 is in its second daylight pass of this exercise. Jim Lovell has his tether extended and taut. He turns off both spacecraft and Agena control systems. The tether remains taut. The two vehicles move through space, maintaining their positions without use of thrust or fuel, a technique important for future space missions. After four hours and 20 minutes, the tether exercise was ended. Command pilot level jettisoned the tether. The mission had now lasted 51 hours and 51 minutes. It was time for the crew to separate from their target vehicle. They would perform a six foot per second pause grade maneuver to give them sufficient clearance. Target vehicle and spacecraft went their separate ways and the crew slept. The next day was Monday and it began for the crew at 1.15 a.m. over the Rosenot Victor tracking ship. The crew had a third and final EVA ahead of them. It was a stand-up EVA this time, devoted to ultraviolet photography. But there would also be an opportunity to jettison some excess EVA equipment no longer needed. The hatch was opened at 66 hours 11 minutes. The pilot took ultraviolet photographs of the sunrise and of selected constellations. After 51 minutes, the hatch was closed, and with it, the crew had closed out three planned EVAs with remarkable success. Not long after this, Gemini 12 received its flight update for a 60-1 recovery. It would now fly the full four days and come down in the primary recovery area in the western Atlantic. Tuesday, the fourth day, began on a familiar note. The crew was awakened early. Flight Director Krantz was checking the fuel cells again, but no major problem. Although the more dramatic segments of flight were behind Gemini 12, the crew was quite busy completing outstanding experiments. A preliminary retrofire time of 94 hours was transmitted to them. Suddenly, a lot of time seemed to have gone by very quickly. 19 months since Virgil Grissom and John Young walked up this ramp, the first crew for the first two-man spacecraft. It hardly seemed possible, so matter of fact it was, that Gemini 12 was making its last pass over the Canaries and the last pass of the Gemini program. There were brief words with other old friends, Kino, Nigeria, Tananarive, Carnarvon, Australia. And we are one minute from retrofire. Mark. All aircraft are on station as of 1849 Zulu. A network SRO. Go SRO. Roger, I have an IP for you from our computer. Okay. Discovery. 24 shoot. degrees, 44 minutes Roger north. Roger, understand me. The prime recovery ship, the USS Wasp, was on station some 600 miles east of Cape Kennedy as the retro rockets fired. The Wasp waited, as she had on four other occasions for Gemini 4 and Gemini 6, for 7 and Gemini 9. Slightly more than 30 minutes to wait with her helicopters scanning the sky. The spacecraft is entering the Earth's atmosphere at 400,000 feet. We have a chance to make the last ride down with the crew, looking out the pilot's window. This film of re-entry was shot at six frames a second. We are projecting it at normal speed, 24 frames, so our ride will be just a little fast. Heat of re-entry becomes intense. Particles flake off the ablative heat shield and fly onto the window. The intense heat will now break off our communication with the ground for about four minutes.
We are midway across the continent near the Mississippi Delta. The crew has been coming in for 27 minutes. Communications blackout is over. A ground station talks to Jim Lovell. Well, Houston, miles. our data shows you're right in the money. Roger. Roger. Less than 10 minutes to splashdown. Main parachute sighted in full view of the WASP. The Atlantic Chief uh, from the WASP. They estimate the range of five miles to starboard. They see a yellow okay, orange yeah. chute. Estimating two, altitude uh, 2,000 feet. The slow descent was followed down to the water by cameramen and relayed to the nation by television. Well, Houston, we've got you on the boob tube. You look good. Splashdown. The Gemini 12 flight is officially over at 2.21 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It passes into history. The recovery mission begins. The WASP was almost alongside the spacecraft as it splashed down. Rescue swimmers were in the water with a flotation collar, ready to check in with the crew. Jim Lovell was the first to be lifted into the waiting helicopter. It returned immediately with the sling to pick up Ed Aldrin. Both were soon aboard and receiving the congratulations of the helicopter crew. There would be time later to summarize the Gemini program, to add up the major accomplishments we now take for granted. Rendezvous and docking, long duration missions, EVA, pinpoint re-entry. There is a just share for contractor, for Department of Defense, NASA, for flight crew and ground crew, and most of all, for the man in the street for whom this program is ultimately designed and without whom it has no meaning. But this day belongs to Gemini 12 and its crew. We must not stint them. These men set out to do a job and finished that job thumbs up. Command pilot and pilot had added five hours, 28 minutes of EVA exposure to the Gemini record. Each established his own individual record. Jim Lovell has flown longer in space than any other man, 18 days, 14 days on Gemini 7, four days just behind him. Buzz Aldrin set his record of two hours, nine minutes on umbilical EVA at workstations. The crew increased our experience at tethered station keeping after successful rendezvous and docking. Finally, Gemini 12 added 14 successful experiments to the Gemini program, which has collected research data for scientists on every flight. More than 50 experiments were conducted on this program. In the tradition of manned flights, the Gemini mission flag is lowered for the last time at the manned spacecraft center. As it comes down slowly, we hear an echo of the words of the program manager. It is now time to go on to bigger things. And we will be able to go on with confidence because there was this program, and it was called Gemini. <laughs>